Out one game of Denver. Well, welcome back, everybody. We are back again after a um, two week, three two week hiatus. Two yeah. week hiatus. Um, I'm sorry, I was uh, I was a little busy last week. Um, we uh, we had Holy Week going on. Hopefully, most of you uh, know that, and it went very well. Um, we have Marissa back. Marissa, it's great to see you again. Uh, so it's time to get back to answering some questions. Um, uh, real quick before we start, what would you say? is the most challenging aspect of uh, Holy Week for you? Waiting to eat lamb. There we that, go. That's, that's one Answered of... like a true Greek. All right. <laughs> no, uh, I, I really, uh, I really in, enjoy it. Now that I've, uh, the first couple of Holy Weeks are just, you know, they're really stressful because, 
you know, the answer is that you don't know what you're doing as a priest. I mean, you just don't know what you're doing. All right. Uh, so, but once you get a couple of under your belt, you know, three or four, and you know how the system works, I hate to call it a system, but you know how, the, how it works, you know, then you could just kind of relax and just get right into it and get into the flow and look forward to it. And, and I, in particular, I love, uh, I, I love getting kids involved because I know in Tarpon, when I was growing up, we didn't get involved in anything. No, we, you know? we just jumped into the water. What's that? In January. Uh, that's what the boys did. They that's what the up. boys yeah. did. Yeah. Spoiler. Polar plunge, the, the the polar plunge. No, no, no. Well, right? it wasn't a polar plunge. We were going after the cross. Yeah, oh, in tarpon, like, it's tarpon. It's it not. Was, the... It was a polar plunge with a religious twist. Yes, That's pretty much what it was. Right, right. In Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I, I, uh, you know, I get them involved um, in uh, on Palm Sunday. Uh, we you know we have the kids all making the making the palms, and then on that Palm Sunday, I actually buy these palm fronds, and then I have the kids waving them. If you've watched any of our videos, so I have them waving as we're coming as we're coming through, uh, and then we have our our youth our Holy Week youth retreat on Holy Friday, and that's where I have the kids take the help me take Jesus off the cross, and they wrap him. And this year we had this really excellent program where uh, our our Sunday school teachers had them do three projects. One was they made their own perfume. And then they they made their own little lanterns. And then they made uh, these little decorative bags for petals. And so what we did is we actually ended up using them. So when all the kids came up, I had them wrap Jesus in the sheet. And then I said, okay, now, just like they did then, I want you to anoint him. So they took their perfume and they sprinkled oh, it on there. Wow. And then I said, okay, and now go ahead and, and put your rose petals on there. So they went into their little bags and they put rose petals on there, you know. And then I said, okay, now we have to carry Jesus to the tomb. So we, we the kids all picked it up and they went around. And I had all the kids carrying their lanterns, oh, you know, lighting the way, you know. That's so sweet. It was, it was really very cool. And then, and then of course, um, on Agape Sunday... I have the kids choir, so I bring both of the kids up, uh, bo all the kids up there on both sides, and we have competitions about who can do the Kiria Lace on the best. And I just had, I just had fun with it. Um, I was excited. Yay. And all of those were live streams, so if you want to check it out, check out our Holy Week uh, 2022 playlist. 2022 <laughs> playlist. I, that's what we're gonna call it. So, uh, oh, and this is my. Icon of the day. Aw. Isn't that cute? That, yeah, I like yeah. it. So, uh, so she did uh, She did an icon. And she mailed it to well, me. Who did? What? Who, who did? One of, one of my parishioners. Uh -oh. <laughs> one of my parishioners. And, in fact, you got to see this. Now, well, while you're doing that, has this uh, been properly, has this icon been properly anointed? Hmm? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. I'm not sure what you mean. Well, are you, you going to, I mean, uh, bless, are you going to put it behind the altar for 40 days? I, that's right. I have to put this behind the altar for 40 yeah. days. So here's the envelope that I got. Wow, that's really isn't cute. That, isn't that's that cool? really cute. <laughs> so she actually addressed uh, the envelope to me. Uh, yeah, you're blocking whoop, there. Uh-oh, wait a minute. I can't. Uh... Maybe you want to block their address. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, how do I hold this? Okay. So I just thought. How cool is that, right? That is cool. Aww. So, well, luckily, I think the address was blocked. Yeah. So, already. I think oh, it's fine. Okay. <laughs> so, anyways, that's my uh, that's the icon. Um, so, and... if you have a two thousand dollar check, you know where to mail it. Yes, that's yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> it's not the cooties. No, it's not the. Um, one more thing. Finally, we used. Oh, sorry. Finally. <laughs> Oops. Uh oh. <laughs> You're gonna be in trouble. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know, you gotta you know, Demos has to earn his living, so every once in a while I gotta. Um but I Terry and I uh finally started watching The Chosen. Because uh somebody's been asking me, a couple of people have asked me, have you, what do you think about Chosen? What do you think about Chosen? So we finally what what's the matter? Your collar. Oh. <laughs> so what is The Chosen about? Do okay. you want to tell people who might have never heard of the show before? Well, at least in season one, it's the it's the beginning of Jesus's ministry. So this is where he's selecting his disciples, and Nicodemus plays a fairly significant role in these in this first season. Um, so our overall commentary, and Bessie Dada can can chime in here if she'd like, but our overall commentary is 
I think it's very well done. You know, you're always a little skeptical about, you know, religious programs, you know, and this one, uh, great acting, right? The actors are very, very good. And what I really like about this is they use modern language. You know, I mean, I don't think he said, well, that's not our bag or this is not our thing, but he uses this very modern language that that is slang for us that we would understand but we get to hear what it would sound like in their right common language. Mm -hmm. So I really, really like that. Um, and they play the characters very well. Like Peter has always been written as this, you know, um, he's got a hot temper. Uh, he's, he's very passionate. Uh, he wants to get the job done. And this is the way they portray Peter. Now, they invent a couple of things along the way and they take some liberties here and there. But the character of who Peter is comes out. Um, Jesus comes, his humanity really comes out in this episode. I really, really like that. So, you know, they don't, you know, they don't make him a, um, um, they don't make him like an Adonis, you know, or like, uh, what's the guy with the, uh, the margarine commercial with the long flowing hair? Who is that? Oh, Fabio. Fabio. Yeah. They don't make him like a Fabio or anything like that. He's a normal human being, which is what we believe him to be. I mean, he's not normal, you know, in his humanity, he's right. And so they did a great job on that. <clears throat> um, John the Baptist, they made look like a crazy person. Um, and then Nicodemus, his his part when he met with Jesus, oh, okay, they took a little too few liberties for my taste. But overall, highly recommended watch. Absolutely. I think it, it really gives you a feel for what I think it would have been like um uh at, at that time the uh i love this the uh the one with the paralytic that they put through the roof they did that it was it came out uh, i think the story came out really well so how many stars would you rate it out of five out of five i'd give i personally would give that four 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 what do you four yeah only you know I, again i'm just i'm just being an orthodox priest and saying hey the theology wasn't exactly right so i'm taking a half point off mm. for that so what? the big the big takeaway is uh, Jesus, unlike Fabio, is a normal human being. Being, yeah. Well, oh yes, there's <laughs> that's the takeaway. Exactly right. <laughs> All right. Well, we got some. Uh, we have a lot of questions in. Uh, <laughs> shall we? Uh, and a lot of uh, messages saying uh, Christos Onesti. from all of us, Alifos Onesti. That's right. So let's start this off properly, right? You want to sing it together? No. Come on. Christos Anesti ek nekron thanaton patisas ketisen tisnimasi zoi charisamenos. I just don't have a good singing voice. No, I heard it. I heard it. It was I'm a nice just, accompaniment. I'm like, oh, oh, my voice is terrible. So, Christos Anesti, Christ is risen, everybody. For those that are listening from Scotland, Ha Christa Eri. And for those of us, uh, those uh, for those of you listening from uh, the planet Kronos. You know, no, no. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I am remiss. I did say it last year in Klingon, so I have to go back and remember how to do it and how to say it in Klingon. <laughs> and then we'll add Elvish. We'll make this all inclusive. You say it in Elvis. Elvish. 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 I thought you said like Elvis. Well, I mean, hey, you could show this, Stephen. <laughs> well, you should add that to your repertoire. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we? All right. Yes. Um, so the first question is from Nick Carvelas. Uh, hey, Nick. He says, uh, uh, good. In order to avoid going to hell, or must you have a willingness uh, to help others to be good? Well, uh, hopefully I can make. Yeah, that makes well, sense. from an Orthodox perspective, remember, it's not just about being good. Atheists are good, right? Most most atheists are good people, just like most Christians are good people. OK, so we can't use being good as a ticket. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be good, but <clears throat> you are not you are from an orthodox perspective you are not going to heaven if you do not confess that jesus christ is your lord and savior after that the good deeds will come because you want to live a life in christ but it's not enough to be good mm. uh trench says christos anesti, anesti. anesti. Thank you. 
Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, says, um, there's been a lot of talk about abortion lately, which makes me wonder, would it be sinful to get an abortion if child labor would result in both the death of the infant and mother? So <clears throat> there are, okay, so from a very technic, uh, from a very, uh, 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 I think that's just like death in labor, right? Well, well, it's because that's it, not an abortion. That's just nature doing that. Not that it's a good thing, right? But. Well, uh, but I, but I see what she's saying is that if the doctor comes in and says, oh. if this baby comes, if we deliver this baby, there is the yeah. high potential that you will die. Okay, so I don't want to say that the Orthodox Church has extenuating circumstances. Our position always is, from an academia standpoint, from a hard uh, a discipline standpoint, the answer is always no. That has to be God that decides what is the outcome. However, in our our economia, we understand that the person, the woman, it can make that decision. So, you know, well, let me take that back. No, the husband and wife together as one, right? Because we consider them one. The husband and wife together make the decision about what is appropriate for them. They may want to make the decision to say, you know what? We are putting this, we are placing this in God's hands and what happens, happens. And we will accept the death if it happens. Okay. There are others who don't have as much faith. Okay. And Jesus Christ does not condemn them. And they say, you know what? I want my wife to live. And we have made the decision that we will not bring the baby to term. The Orthodox Church is not going to say this is not a sin, but the Orthodox Church will understand and through compassion and mercy and economia will then offer that reconciliation to the mother. OK, so we have to be very careful that we can never say, OK, you know, here are the circumstances where you can have an abortion. We're never saying that, but we're understanding that the couple together and there's another distinction that I have to make. And this is where we fall off the rails in terms of my body, my right. The two of them are one in the Orthodox Church. They jointly have to make the decision about what is appropriate because the husband may want to bring the child to term. So it is not just her decision. That is that is not correct. So what do you do in that case? Right. Say there is a disagreement one way or the other. Someone's like, I don't want to go through with this if I'm going to die. And the husband's like, I want you to go through with this. Or what if, you know, uh, you know, the woman is like well, I want to do this, like, I want to have my baby, and even though it's a risk to me, and the husband's like, no, I don't want you to go through with this, like, I'm going to lose you, and I'm going to lose the baby, like, what if there's discontent, what, like, I, I'm sure that's not a unique situation, like, what would someone have to do if there's a disagreement? Well, <clears throat> so in, so in that situation, then, um, it, it is because the mother is physically carrying the child, okay, she does have to make a decision for her own life, okay? So uh, what I was describing is a situation where there is not a danger. The, the wife just says, I just don't want to have this kid. And the, and the husband says, no, I really want this child. Then the church would see that as a sin if she takes that right away from him and aborts the child. What you're saying now is... She's like, they're in labor. Right. She's, I don't know, there's something precarious happening and a decision has to be made. Well, I guess potential that the mother will die. Yeah. You know, and uh, um, all the church can do is is guide them in the decision that they're going to make. They can't make the decision for them. And so if the wife now wants to live, she's young, 23, 25, whatever she is, you know, and she wants to live, you know, the Orthodox Church will support the fact that she has that right, okay? So for the husband now to come in and say, well, I want to take that chance with your life, then the Orthodox Church, I would say, I would say you have to consider this from her perspective, right? And if it really truly is dangerous, then you have to let her make that decision, all right? And they'll have to do, you know, they'll have to make the the ultimate decision, or she will have to make the ultimate decision in the in the end. Hmm. Uh, you know, you also I mean, mentioned the, the age, you know, early 20s. I mean, 
They also have to take into consideration that's practically, you know, you're barely out of childhood at that point. Yeah, I, you know, I don't. What? Most... She's young, 2023. 20, she's 40, she's old. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say that too. She's 40, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, yeah, I was going to say I'm if you're kidding. 32, 35, you're still young. You're still young. Okay. Yeah. All right. no, but I'm yeah. saying that yeah. you're still like, yeah. you're practically, you're barely out of childhood at that point. Yeah. Like, yourself. you know, and, um, you know, not, not everybody can make that sacrificial decision to to potentially end their lives that's a that's a very tough thing yes okay fine yeah. it's it's a decision difficult decision at 40 and at 50 and it hey i'm not uh, ready to uh, i'm not ready to end my life either you know so yeah yeah well yeah, yeah that's yeah, right you can still have an abortion yeah that's right i'm i'm that's off the table for me so <laughs> i mean nowadays anything can yeah, happen that's right <laughs> Uh, Jack Sage Phoenix says, good, well, evening, everyone, and God bless. Um, and they're wondering, is the Orthodox Church in communion with the Orthodox Church of America slash Russian Orthodox Church? If an OCA congregant came to your church, would they be allowed to take communion? The answer is simple from an OCA perspective is yes. There is, there is some tension there because... There is some question about the authenticity of their autocephaly. Okay, you know, uh, it, was it proper for uh, f for Russia to grant it? Was it proper for, or should the Patriarch of Constantinople have for granted it? For those that might not know, can you define autocephaly? So, uh, autocephaly, different from uh, from autonomous, means that. Well, let's start there. An aut uh, an autonomous church belongs to a mother church, like a patriarchate, mm -hmm. Constantinople, Alexandria, but they have the right to administer themselves. But liturgically, they belong to the mother church. Autocephalus means that the, the mother church has granted them the ability to not only be administratively independent, but liturgically independent also, ecclesiastically in, in, independent. So they can now, they can choose their own bishops, they can choose their own priests, so on and so forth. Whereas, whereas an, auto, an a, 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 autonomous church, like the GOA, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, cannot select their own bishops. That has mm. to go through the mother church. Mm. So if someone from like, yeah, a Russian Orthodox or OCA church, could they come take communion? I think the yes. answer was yes. Yeah, the answer the answer is is yes. And then uh, the related question from Jack is, can a member of the Orthodox church take communion at a Catholic or Protestant church, assuming that church would permit it? Okay, so the answer to that is the is the Catholic church and the Protestant Church permit Orthodox to receive communion. Yeah. We do not. We don't, we but don't. they might. No, not they might. They do. They do. They okay. do. But that does not give a, an Orthodox Christian the right to receive communion in that church because the Orthodox Church forbids our parishioners, us, from receiving the sacrament of Eucharist in their church. Yeah. Um, Trench says that, um, I heard that if one wants to be a better Christian to pray, but if nothing happens for years or never does, um, it means that God doesn't want you to be better or are you, um, to blame still when you are asking or praying? Well, okay. So here we, here we end up with the, this is, this is a, a great point to be made here. The problem is God answers the prayers but when people say my prayer isn't answered, it's because they already had an idea of how the prayer was supposed to be answered. But another answer is provided. I have personally experienced that many, many times in my life that that some I have prayed for something. I have not got I have not gotten that, but as something else I've received. And when I look back on in Revelation, I'm like, oh, good grief. I'm glad this didn't happen. This was the right decision to be made. So if your prayers are not being answered, then what you are is you are trying to force God into what you're asking for. And the prayer is, should always be, here's my prayer, if it be your will, and then leave yourself open for what is the will of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Uh, Nathan asks, are we going to be in the new earth or new heaven or maybe both? And I understand the new earth, but why is why will Christ create the new heaven? So, do you know what he's referring to? Like, 
what is the new earth what is the new heaven so i don't i don't think you know as as far as i as far as i understand it there is no there is no new heaven the orders are set okay but a new a renewed paradise will be recreated for us so and again i take the i take the slant of my uh, old testament uh old testament theology uh, professor uh pentioch uh who says that what god created in genesis was good there was nothing wrong with it we have stained it with what we do whether that's global warming whether that's pollution uh um what we've done to the seas those are sins that we have put upon the earth there's nothing wrong with the earth what god will do is renew paradise so that it can be what it once was so in that sense we don't see it as new we see it as brought back to what it was it's mentioned in revelations about a new earth and a new heaven so Presbyterus okay, yeah. said uh, it's mentioned in Revelations that there will be a new earth and a new heaven. What what chapter if you is that? Couldn't hear her. <laughs> Revelations. <laughs> oh, that's the joke. What 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 verse is it? Is yeah. The oh. Um, but oh. while he's oh. doing that, uh, Jack asks uh, how your week was. My Demos. week. My week was great. Uh, I kind of kind of took the week a little lightly. Uh, considering we did what uh, twelve live streams, during, yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Live streams and, and and an Easter video during uh during Holy Week. That's a lot. So, but uh, I I took it. It was a relaxing week. I was supposed to go on a trip, but that um that got pushed back a little bit, which is why we have the show today. Uh, but uh, fully fully recovered and excited for uh, prospects to come. Yay! Cool. All right. Did did you... Say Sadie joined said who still send us. Oh, ah, yes. yeah. Sadie Alithos Anesti. So did we, uh, did we find the verse? Oh, yeah, tw uh, verse verse 21. I, and then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Ge idon uranon, ge non, ge yin, ge nin. Okay, so again, using that for, using that for, for new. Now, what, again, nobody knows what is going to happen, but this is, you know, from what, from what I learned at seminary, this is, one of the outcomes based on what is read the reading from genesis also remember what uh what dr constantino said is that the orthodox belief is that revelations was written for something that already happened so the new earth is, that that's created here is now that that jesus has come to usher in now the new um not only the new covenant, but also a reclamation, a salvation of both the earth and heavens. Well, his salvation, and of course, you know the the cultural impact of Christianity is it's in a as, as, as create right yeah. in that sense has uh, um, has figuratively created a new earth, right? As far as a new heaven, do you think that could be um, there could be some connection to the concept of Eden as heaven on earth? I don't. I mean that that yeah, and and that 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 lines up very very well with again what God created is good. Yeah. But uh, a little bit of a homework assignment. We'll look for some more a little bit of Orthodox commentary there. All right, go ahead. We got another question. Yeah. Um. So trench is. Oh, the computer just did something interesting. Oops. All uh, right. Well, while while I figure that out. Um. So trench's question is. Why is Jesus called the light? Thank you. Yet they call the devil the light bringer. And the Pascha is called Bright Lambri in Greece, which is the name uh, the name day to represent that day, but never mentioned in the U.S. So how can Jesus be called the light, the devil the light bringer, and Pascha called the Bright Lambri? How, how does that fit in? Well, I mean... It it went black and then now it's doing this. Sorry, well, everyone. Jesus himself in John chapter eight tells us. Jesus spoke to them again and said, "I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life." Okay, so the reason that we say that Jesus is light is because these are Jesus's own words. All right now. Um, there is, and I'm trying to recall where that verse is. 
um, that that uh, Satan can disguise himself as an angel of light. Okay, and and Thank that you. is written in a deceiving sense, in that Greek sense of planis or planos, to be a deceiver, to show yourself as something that you are not. So in that sense, he shows himself to be the false light. But it is Jesus who is the true light that brings life. Mm. Uh, so Django Fat says, first time tuning into this live, welcome. And that's an awesome name, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? Uh, do, oh. do, do, do. Ah, so, uh, Orthodox Study Bible. Um what is the commentary on Revelations verse 21? Now I saw a new heaven and earth. Verse 21. The New Testament teaching that the present world will pass away does not mean the present creation will be utterly destroyed, but will be renewed, freed from corruption, purified, transfigured, and glorified. And that is page 1744 of the Orthodox Study Bible. Hmm. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. uh, Trench sends a smiley face, and Jack says, glad we're back, yeah, and that we're glad you too. missed this. And hello, Nathan, as well. Yeah, hello, Nathan. Um, Nicholas, uh, says, was St. Thomas really doubtful when he asked to touch Jesus, or was he actually super faithful? And do the individual wounds of Jesus have any sort of symbolic meaning? Well, I mean, um... Thomas was doubting. I mean, there's, I mean, we, I, how can you uh, dissect his words any other way? He, he, I mean, he, the gospels record that he says, unless I see this, I will not believe. That's pretty clear. I mean, so, but as I said in my sermon last Sunday, this gives us hope because those people that have faith, like my parents and my grandparents, who could believe without having to reason it all out. They believe because they believe. Jesus supports that. The gospel support that because there were many that did believe. Okay, But for those of us, like myself, who had to go through college and go, okay, I need a better explanation here. I've, I've got to reason this out a little bit better. I, I, I get it with the faith, but I can't have blind faith. It's not who I am. All right? So I need to understand, I need to touch the theology, okay? And, and what Thomas gives us in the gospel is hope for people like me, that, that without Thomas, then I would be relegated to the outside to say, well, you know what, unless you can believe like your grandparents believed, you know what, you're, you're out. You have to forget reason, and I cannot do that. So Thomas is the one who gives me hope. Absolutely, he doubted, but... He achieved the decision because Jesus says, fine. He didn't scold him. He didn't say, ah, oh, you unbelieving jerk. He says, go ahead, touch me. Here I am, right? Feel me. And he did. And he said, my Lord and my God. Okay. Mm. So, so in that sense, it gives both sides hope. Those who need reason and those who can believe with blind faith. And both of those can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, the last part of that was... Um, like, does does Christ's uh, individual wounds have some sort of symbolic meaning? Well, okay, for us, they indicate his ongoing sacrifice in his humanity for our, for our salvation. Mm -hmm. It is the physical manifestation of that. Uh, Napoleon Bonaparte um, says, uh, I have many secular friends who don't take religion seriously. What is a good argument for orthodoxy or even Christianity in general? Well, so now we have Thomas, right? We're back to Thomas again, yeah, right? Yeah, in a okay. way, yeah. Okay. Um, Christianity, rightfully so, and again, I'm speaking from an American context, right? Growing up here in America. And Demos will back me up on this. Christianity, unfortunately, in this country has been presented in a very goofy way. We come across as goofs, 
Okay, you know, with all of our goofy stories and uh, and um, you know, the Bible is perfect. It's uh, it, it's uh, we have to take everything literal. Uh, how come you're not praying enough? If you don't believe, then you're not a good Christian. So we have these ridiculous arguments, and people see that and they say, "I can't take this seriously." You know, I mean, I mean, if if I came to your office and I said, and I said, "I'm I'm a physics professor." And you said, oh, you are. Okay. Well, you know, tell me something. Well, um, Einstein was a very smart uh, person and uh, he thought up a lot of good things. And you're like, yeah, okay. Now, here. Now, now, show me how to solve this equation. Well, I'm not really sure what that is, but, uh, but I know that your answer is right. You'd be laughing at me, right? This is the same thing that has happened in Christianity. So this is, and, and we as Orthodox have done the same thing. We have not learned our faith. So when people ask us questions, we give them these nonsensical answers because we don't, we don't understand our faith. We don't know who Jesus Christ is, all right? So that's where blind faith can be a little bit dangerous because for those people that, that need that reason, you can't just say to them, well, just believe. Yeah. Well, give me some backing. Okay, so we are at fault because we have presented Christianity in a very goofy and third grade manner. And we're much, much better than that. The fathers of the church have given us deep theology. The Protestant uh, th theologians, uh, Martin Luther, Tillich, Bultmann, Schnackenberg, they've all given us very, very intelligent reasoning. And we have to know what our theology is. And then they will respect us. But you can't respect somebody who doesn't understand or know what they're talking about. There's another aspect to that, if I, if I may. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's also like the... The concept of religious education. When I say religious education, I don't mean you know just trying to get the stories in people's heads. I'm just talking about really delving and exploring the theology. If you want to be uh, to represent or even evangelize Christianity, and you haven't read the Bible, you haven't done you haven't done your own studies, then any argument that's going to be thrown at you is gonna you're gonna crumble. The only thing you can say is because it's right. It's because yeah, because, you know? exactly. Yeah. It, and, right, right. So mm -hmm. I actually, in in many ways, part of what we do this show is to inspire that that um, that strive for knowledge. All right, and you would have, and and this show, the the listeners of our show would have absolutely no respect for me if all of my answers were well, that's the way it is, and. <laughs> You know, and uh, that's what the father said. You know, they'd have no respect for me. You, you've got to present it in a very logical way. You're absolutely The show right. will be much easier to produce. So, yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> I think also another way to kind of um, make a case for it is to not necessarily make a case at all, but just lead by example. You know, model, Silent witness. Yeah, like model the behavior and when asked about it, like emphasize that you know, your behavior was influenced by your behave, by your behave, your faith. Sorry. Your okay. I can't English today. <laughs> okay. I can't any language today, but, um, so, and the other thing that I would add to that is, is use the Socratic method of dialogue, meaning that you turn it back on them. Okay. Why don't you take the faith seriously? Well, because of XXS answer that question. Okay. So now, why don't you believe that Jesus is God? And then they say, and then you answer it. So the Socratic method is to turn it back on them. You know, you say that you don't take it seriously. Tell me why. Yeah. Right? And so you can do that. And, and like I said, through that and through silent witness of your actions, that you truly are a proponent. And you do have to have fire in your soul. I mean, to, to that you really believe. You can't just say... Yeah, Jesus Christ is God, and I'm very happy. Yeah. Like, I had a friend recently come to me um, who also works in my field, and he was lamenting because, like, of course you would expect in physics not many people, you know, believe in God. And he was asking me, like, Marissa, how do I handle these people who are judgmental? Like, I mm. feel like I have to – and I was just like, you should never defend it. You know, in the sense of like, right, like, oh, this yes, is, yes. Their, their judgment upon you is more about them than it is yeah, good, you, good you know. Point. So mm -hmm. it's like, again, pulling like the question of like, well, why do you feel that way? Like, what is it about 
my faith that really bothers you. I like, yep. Let me show you that, like, it's not what you think it is. But you're right. Once you become defensive, it just feeds yeah. them. And yeah, and you should never feel that way about it or feel like, you know, you should never feel shame attached to it or embarrassment, you 100%. know. Uh, we have uh, two follow-up comments on ah, this topic. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one is from uh, Jack Sage. Um, the U.S. was founded, because you talked about the U.S., American perspective. The U.S. was founded and established as the, as the spiritual was being separated from secular aspects of life during the Enlightenment. And it really shows in our culture. Probably also was a primary driver for many of the blind faith revivals in the early 1800s seeking to fill that void but but being able to reconcile it with enlightenment thinking before we go to our second comment do you do you have a uh do you have anything to add to that well i i now the orthodox church doesn't believe in separation of church and state our christian principles are our our islamic principles our jewish principles guide our daily actions you know and to say that they don't is 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 a lie. Yeah. So so there is no such thing as separation of church and state because you you can't physically do that. But yes, through the Enlightenment, then we tried, unfortunately, to use reason to explain it, and and the reaction, the 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 the, the blowback from that right became then the revivals of no no just believe. And uh, Santa Man One uh, says hello again. By the way. The best argument for your secular friends is the following greeting. <laughs> to my Christian friends, happy Easter. To my Jewish friends, happy Hanukkah. To my atheist friends, good luck. <laughs> oh, that, is kind of, that is kind of funny. I got it. Good luck. To my atheist friends, good luck. <laughs> you know? Aww. Uh, Trench uh, says, um, after Christ said, um, blessed are those that believe without seeing him, Christ said miracles were done so people can believe, which is logical. So why isn't the non-burning holy fire presented more in the United States? Yes, please explain that, because uh, I, I know a lot of people who are not aware that this is a thing. Um, so uh, and and apparently, you know, and again, I'm not I'm not there. So but uh, but my understanding is that the holy fire that is uh, how, do, how do you say like lit without uh uh, lit without being lit uh well, i mean it's uh spontaneous spontaneous right. uh, they're spontaneously combusted right, yeah. right right uh this will only work with the orthodox so i guess the catholic have the catholics have tried this and it hasn't worked so the spontaneous flame only works with the orthodox faith so i agree you know, why as Orthodox, why aren't we talking more about the holy light, about the holy fire that emanates from the tomb of Christ? I mean, this is an event that happens year after year. And there have been scientists and uh, and debunkers who have gone in there and tried to figure out, you know, the patriarch's got a secret match that he lights and then he <laughs> lights the whole thing up. And none of that, none of that happens. They've They've got some film. They don't have the film actually in there, but they have the film and... And uh, it's incredible the way that it happens. Now, again, can that be explained? No. That now that is now that's faith. I mean, you believe that or not? But I do agree with Trench. Why aren't we spreading, you know, that as one of the miracles of the fact that yes, Jesus Christ is here and He's alive. And we should start a petition to get the Tartan priests to be the first people on site to record it happening. <laughs> yes. I'm standing here in front of the Holy Sepulchre. In your kilt. In my kilt. Yes, right. Uh, Aaron 88205 says, Christ has risen. Truly he has Truly risen. Truly he has risen. Uh, my first question is, uh, the holy light which emanates on every Holy Saturday is brought to some churches throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Is that light on your church's altar as well father uh no that that uh, we did we did at one time uh when i first got here at 2019 the holy fire was being passed around and i received it from um where did i receive from the romanian church oh. and they brought it over here and it was but unfortunately i wasn't able to keep it lit Aww. the whole time so no so i'm hoping for another try at this so aaron be honest i mean yeah i lost the holy fire oh aaron also asks whether or not and related whether or not your altar lamp ever gets extinguished 
Oh yeah, because uh, because I don't keep track of it. I mean, I'm just admitting here. <laughs> you know, the uh, that's why I use the seven day candle. You know, um, uh, I I used to use the actual oil with the little wick in it, but in my uh, in my first church, I had a wooden altar, and I came back one time and it was spilled over, so I didn't want to catch the church on fire. So ever since, I've used the seven day candle now. But I got to be very diligent about going back in there. You know, when it's kind of low, and then replacing the candle out. And uh, one quick clarification, Santa Man 1 uh, meant to say good evening, everyone, uh, not to announce a Fox event. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I was, yeah, I saw that and I was like, I will just leave that be. <laughs> um, but uh, Jack has a second question. Um, how does one reconcile Jesus's animation uh, to love one's enemies with righteous violence? For example, <laughs> defense of the innocent or of the faith? With righteous violence, hmm. I'm unfamiliar with. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know, I know. He said, "I d do not think that I have, do not think that I have come to, uh, do not think I have come in peace, but I have come with a sword." I did, you know. Jesus does say that, and that's a very, that's a difficult passage. Uh, but um, Jack also recommends um, for you know the Christosynestiing to also include High Valerian and Atlantean. In the languages used, all I'm completely down with that. <laughs> I'm surrounded by nerds. <laughs> I'm just being funny. I'm also a nerd. Um, well, we're at it. Let's add Hatties. You know, let's add some Star Wars languages. And <laughs> oh dear. Um. Okay. What was the? What, what was that? The, the, I come with Jesus. Uh, love one's enemies with righteous violence. I don't remember the passage as well, so I'm very curious about this. Yeah. And I'm also very curious to see if this is also something that is um, metaphorical rather than literal. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. <laughs> um, so while we're looking uh, that up, let's see if we can jump ahead a little bit. Um, Django Fett mentions that abortion is a very hot button topic and Yes, um, it it's I, I sense it's going to be a topic that's going to be uh, very much discussed over over the summer. So we'll try to space out those questions as much as we can. Uh, did you get your? Um... Yeah, all it, yeah, and uh, and it, it'll require a little bit more because when I uh, when I do a Google search, all it says is Jesus shows we must always respond to violence with an act of love. Matthew's nonviolent Jesus and violent parables um uh what does the bible say about violence put away violence and oppression so i'm not finding that so this is this is a research topic and to be honest i you know we've mentioned this quite often that we we, we kind of put aside the questions that we find interesting or require more research we kind of also put them aside in um uh, with the hopes of turning them into orthodoxy 101 or fact versus fiction and especially going into the, the um, well, not going into, we've been dealing with this for a few years about how uh, the, the context of violence and how much violence is or is not appropriate when it comes to certain things happening. Mm -hmm. So I think this will be a very interesting topic to explore much further in a um, in a one on one format. What do you think, Father? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I mean, Jesus did say some very shocking things. Like I said, you know, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Um, um, uh, anyone that puts hus uh, father, fa uh, father, daughter, or mother against me uh, is not worthy of me. Uh, he who loves father, and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Um, he, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So Jesus did say very difficult things, but that particular one I am not familiar with. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So Jack um, kind of wanted to clarify a bit. He said, um, well, for instance, that Jesus told us to turn the other cheek to those who struck us, right? Um, I'm waiting for him to also get in on here. Actually, he's wondering if he can email it, um, if you're going to look at it in detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so email is agocny at gmail.com. That is rather seared in my head. Good. Yeah. All right. yeah. It's, also like in, it's also in the description if, yeah. uh, if anybody wishes. And especially for any question that does, uh, that is 
you know, um, much more detailed, much more nuanced, um, send us an email. And if we can, if we can find a way to shorten our answer and include in the episode, we'll do it. If not, Father will either respond or he might make a video about it. Um, and this has inspired a lot of what we have done. So let's keep that up. Demos, don't make any promises I can't keep. I'm going to shorten the answer. I don't shorten any answers. That's always your I, you know, complaint with so, me. I, sometimes yeah. sometimes uh, my, my faith is misplaced. Yes. What, can I, what can I say? <laughs> yeah, it's really funny because I see Demos so when he's really going and he's like, hmm. you got keep going. <laughs> um, but Club asks or states, I wouldn't believe in God if he didn't grant me proof. Mm, that's going to be tough then. <laughs> um, now, the question is, what proof are you willing to accept? You know, um, if you are looking for finite proof of him speaking to you face to face as he did with Moses and Abraham and Adam, I think you are going to be, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, disappointed. Disappointed. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. You're going to be very disappointed, but there are things that are happening on a daily basis that show us the presence of God. You know, the very fact that we continue to live when any one small mistake happening in our bodies could kill us, right? So the, the fact that all of this works, right? Yeah. You know, uh, even though, you know, we have, well, Keith Richards is proof that God exists, <laughs> right? I mean, come on. That guy Demos should... is very upset oh. about that. Oh, I, th oh I thought you, you were excited because I talked about Keith Richards. Okay. No, he... <laughs> I'm both. <laughs> All right. So, uh, well, I got excited about that. Okay. I mean, you know... So tell us why Keith Richard Richards is Keith, Keith Richards? Yeah, Keith, 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 Keith Richards. Why is he Keith Because Richards. well, he did appear in Pirates of the Caribbean. So no, his lifestyle. You know, yeah, him he's... and him and Eric Clapton, right? Shouldn't they be dead ten times over, mm -hmm. twenty times over from their lifestyle? So God has a purpose for us. There's people that I go and visit in the hospital that you know we don't have last rites, but quote unquote we give them last rites, but they but they rally. You know, there are things that we've asked for, and sometimes we receive it. And like I said, and sometimes we always get an answer, but sometimes we receive something else. So the the miracles, miracles are there to help us in our faith. What we have to do is recognize miracles. They just don't, they're not huge things like the plagues of Egypt, right? They're not huge things like the Red Sea parting. But miracles do occur on a daily basis, but we're not attuned to that because we're looking for a Red Sea kind of miracle. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, if I may add, I mean, what would be the purpose of faith if, you know, God was as visible as a president? You know, you saw him every single day, etc. I mean, there people would, be would no... probably hate him. Yeah. Well, there would be no there would be no no challenge, no, no test of yourself. I mean, it's something that will be ever present. It would be like. You know, there's a McDonald's in every corner. Okay. You know, it just, it, it takes, so, God is so much more than, you know, our everyday lives. Well, okay. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the, uh, that's a good point too. Uh, but people are still going to ask the, I mean, I can hear that answer, but people are still going to say, well, you know, it would be, it would be nice if he could show himself. Why can't he reveal himself? If he's God, why can't he just reveal himself? Right? People are going to say, "Oh, that. No, of course," right. but that's but that's the but challenge that's, of faith. That's the challenge of faith. Yeah, very good. Uh, Alex Roman uh, asks: Is it true that Orthodox priests must be rebaptized in order to become priests? What is the process, in short, of becoming a priest? Kind regards. Okay, so let's just get that straight about the baptism. There is no rebaptism. One baptism for the remission of sins. So no, nobody is rebaptized. I get it. There are some very fundamentalist Orthodox churches out there that are rebaptizing you if you were a Catholic priest or if you were a Protestant pastor, then they are rebaptizing you. But this should not be done in any case. These are fundamentalist mistakes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's get that out of the way. And then the second question is how, how, how do you become a priest? 
Well, you, you, you become a priest not because you need a job. You become a priest because it is a true calling, because somebody has recognized somebody, something in you, like it was in my case. My spiritual father recognized something in me, or you recognize something in yourself, but you go through a spiritual father to see if that calling is proper. You know, not everybody is cut out to be a priest. Maybe you should be a deacon. Maybe you should be a chanter. Maybe you should be uh, a parish council president. There are many, many roles. So a spiritual father will help guide you into what is the proper role. So that's the first step. The first step is if you have a calling, then seek out a spiritual father who will help you develop that calling so that you truly then develop what it is, what is the true calling that God has asked you to do. I, I'm really sorry, but Demos has been laughing the whole time silently over here, and I think it's because Santa Man One just said hospitals named after dead people aren't exactly encouraging. I want to be rushed to the Keith Richards Memorial Hospital. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah, but um, but yeah, like we have a super chat from Tommy Williams, so thank you, Tommy. Um, and he's wondering, is it possible for someone to fully understand God? No. Okay, no, because that was a good he, one. Right. He is, uh, uh, John Christum is, is pretty clear on that, you know, uncircumscribable, incomprehensible, and unknowable. So. And I'm, I'm not skipping everyone for this, but I think this comment is very important, so I want to acknowledge it now. But Carla is wondering why she is currently suffering while she's pregnant. I'm... She already, she says, I already spoke to God and told him that if he wants the people around me to have mercy on me, that won't happen since my last pregnancy, I bleed for three months. That's very sad. Yes, very sad. Uh, but um, but I, I think I missed So it. it sounds like she's asking, like, why do I suffer while I'm pregnant? That's what she says. Well, I mean, it... it it can be just, you know, easily described as, you know, her particular medical condition. It's not a punishment from God, you know. I mean, you know, we, uh, you know, each one of us has a, you know, has particular, you know, we are, uh, we are distorted in our humanity, you know, we are, and through, uh, through, you know, original sin, you know, we are distorted in our humanity. I mean, th those are the consequences. And this could be, could be a condition you know, that is just unique to you or, or, you know, in your family, just like people, just like kids that get childhood cancer. These are, this is not punishment from God, but it's because we live in this fallen world that is, um, um, uh, th that is, is tainted by disease. Uh, 1137 Jam says with, Oh, with respect to the abortion question, what about a situation in which there's no possibility the fetus can survive? For example, a tubular pregnancy. Is abortion in that situation a sin? Well, again, uh, as I mentioned, the I think that's also an ectopic pregnancy where it's like outside of the uterus and that can actually be lethal. I'm not sure. There are, there are a lot of different variations yeah. where that can happen. Yeah. Okay. And again, from an Orthodox perspective, any intervention that is done to either save the woman's life or to end a fetal life in the Orthodox Church is considered a sin. However, the Orthodox Church, through its economia, understands that decisions have to be made. And so what they always ask is that after the, this has happened, then that the person return to the church for healing. Because regardless, and, and I truly believe, and I, and I would think that you would believe also, that regardless of whether the abortion is intentional or is done because of a medical condition, the woman will remain with that scar, that emotional yeah. scar. This is not something that she says, oh, I'm glad this is done. That, that scar remains. Okay, so the church, you know, asks that she come back 
and that we, together with what is the appropriate therapy, make sure that she can reconcile herself back into the church, that she can understand that what she did while, while a sin does not put her outside of the love and communion of the church, okay? Because left to her own devices, it could be very depressing to the point of suicide. And the, the church in her economia understands that. But they cannot say that the action was not a sin. Mm -hmm. But they understand that, that, that through mercy, that sin can be reconciled. So speaking of economia, Django Fat says, is there such a thing as going too far with economia? Not trying to implicate the political sense of the word, but liberal. Like oh, uh, yes, absolutely. Abso absolutely. I mean, right now, right now, the Orthodox Church is not prepared to grant economia for a gay marriage. We are not that that would be economia for us right at this moment in time going too far. Our economia could not extend to saying, if you decide that an abortion is right for you, go ahead and do it. That is extending economia too far to say that. You don't have to believe that Jesus Christ died and was resurrected to be a Christian. That's economia going too far. Yes, absolutely, we can go too far. And this is always the balance that the church has to navigate as society changes, mm -hmm. evolves, changes, whatever you want to say. Uh, Trench says, during the epitaph procession, a priest stopped at the fire station to pray for them <laughs> a few minutes, which isn't that improper for the epitaph to do pit stops? Well, I mean, again, why the epitaphial procession is not salvific. I am not being saved because I process around the church with the epitaphial. These are all man-made rituals, okay? And Jesus was very clear. Was the Sabbath made for man or man for the Sabbath? If that priest decided that what was important at that moment was to strengthen the faith of those firefighters and to show the people that we truly, as the Orthodox Church, care about your safety and welfare, then that was more important than the epitaphial procession. Mm. So uh, Alex just gave us a five, what is a pounds? Five pounds. Uh, five oh, pounds. Or euros. Or euros. euros. I can't tell things. Any oh, yeah. Pounds have like the curly S looking. Yeah, right. And this is more of the E thing. The right? E with the two yeah. dash. Yeah. I thought it was just. Anyway. But thank Ooh. you so much, Alex. That's so nice of you. Anyway, 5.00 in some currency. Yes. No. Well, yeah. if, if it's that thing, it's the it's the, the, the euros. And that's good because it's still worth more than a dollar. So. Oh, no. I also want to uh, say real quick to Nathan and Julie King, uh, they sent in the uh, the verses uh, that we were referencing earlier. So for in case of the new heaven and earth and uh, the oh. angel of light. So we'll be taking those um, those verses and we'll revisit those questions next week. Yeah. And I th well, the heaven and earth thing, I think we answered because, again, the orthodox position is that 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 it is a renewal and not an utter destruction. Oh, you know, I just. Uh, just in case it's add some new content. Sure, right, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Also, Diane, with regard to the previous topic, coming in with, you know, her doctor self, says ectopic pregnancy is usually in the fallopian tube and it is life-threatening to the mother and the baby won't survive. The baby cannot grow there nor be born that way. Mm. So thank you for clarifying. Yeah, thank you, Diane. I appreciate that. And yes, thank you, Nathan. It is a euro. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I should put my glasses back on. But um, getting back up to here, Trench says, I seem happy. Thank you, I guess. Uh, I think I am pretty happy. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, and then Nathan's pointing out that it's Revelations 21.1 and Isaiah 65.17. For? Uh, Christ says uh, he will create a new heaven and earth, but let's, like, revisit that. Um, Donis Georgiou says, Christos Anesti, Alithos Anesti. Anesti. Um, and he's wondering uh, whether or not you can explain why the bishop wears a royal robe. A royal robe. Uh, I think he is talking about the mandia, which is the red kind of cloak yeah. that that, uh, that that comes on. Oh, uh, oh man, I should. Uh... Bishops, it's very little known, but bishops get very cold, <laughs> and it's it's yeah. important that we keep them warm. 
Um, like during the service. Yes, and, and uh, n- normally speaking, the uh, the the uh, the bishop will the bishop will wait at the nar- at the narthex doors into the sanctuary, and the priest will come, and then they will typically put or the deacon will put the mandia on him as he comes in. Now, what that is a particular sign of. I've got to do. Uh, I, 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 that's uh, that's what I'm trying. I'm, that's what I'm trying to remember. I know that I know that we learned that in uh, in in seminary, and I'm trying to recall now. I know the process of putting it on and that he wears it and all that. Uh, but what is its symbology? That's gonna... yeah. Presbyteria was just chiming in. If you were wondering why Father A, if you couldn't hear her, yeah, oh, yes. Uh, whether or not like that's symbolic of Constantinople or and, not and Const- of, Constantine of, of, of Constantine's kingship, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Um, next questions coming from strange places. I like that. <laughs> yeah, questions coming from strange places. Um, are the odd thoughts, memories, bad stuff that come up during praying the Jesus prayer, a cleansing of that stuff by the name of Jesus, or more just distractions that come up during prayer? Distractions, absolutely distractions. Uh, the uh, the evil one. Uh, will do anything that he can to steer your focus away. You know, you'll be uh, praying and then all of a sudden, you know, a commercial will come on for the show that you've been wanting to see, you know, and could I hurry up this prayer so that I can get over to the TV? Or, you know, your wife is cooking something and you smell and you're like, oh, wow, I've got it. You know. So that is distractions from the evil one. Uh, um, Tommy Williams has another super chat and is wondering, is divorce... Um, Except for adultery, a sin. There are um, there are several um, several conditions by which the uh, which the Greek archdiocese will grant permission to remarry. Okay, uh, so it's not just adultery. There are another six. I believe it's a I believe it's seven in total. Uh, those include um, uh, entering into a marriage uh, under false pretenses. Uh, um, saying that you will not, uh, you 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 do not wish to have children, uh, physical or mental abuse, uh, certainly adultery. Um, shoot. You say death by suicide. Uh, well, well, that's what we're looking for. Is we're looking for to grant the permission to remarry. We're looking for the the spiritual death of the marriage and those things would then those that I mentioned would constitute a spiritual death. Um, So it's more than just, uh, just adultery, but outside of those, we normally do not grant permission to remarry. uh, So um, just to clarify with the, the Mandi, I guess the Mandi. Yeah. yeah, um, Anesti says um, that the Mandi um, comes from the Byzantine emperors in short, um, ah, so so that it was correct. Yeah, yes, yeah. okay. And then um, also, Santa Man One is requesting everyone's paraders or prayers for this coming Wednesday as they're having a medical procedure. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely give you our prayers. It's it might take us some time to organize the parade, <laughs> but we'll do our best. Okay. Uh, but let's see. Let's get to some more questions. Are there any questions you see, Demos, that you think? Oh, Would we have we have ask. a lot of great questions. I know, I'm tonight. like So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna oh, jump yeah. uh, around um and go directly to uh in honor of Santa Man one um uh, who's going in. Um he asks, Father, could you discuss this is your favorite topic, toll houses. Oh. How orthodox is the concept? So it 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 was it was really um advanced <laughs> Not begun, but it was really advanced by Father Seraphim Rose, and Father Seraphim Rose um, is, um, uh, is is uh, is is a a monk of uh, in the orth or what, what uh, I don't think was was uh, was a monk in the Orthodox Church, uh, and he published th- this idea or, or this advancement of the idea of tall houses uh, in his book. Um, there has been many refutations to that, and uh, the one that uh, I like the most is, uh, I believe it's uh, Bishop Philotheo of Nafpaktos, and he writes in there that the problem with the tall houses, 
Toll. Toll. <laughs> the problem with the toll houses is that it smacks of the idea of a balance of judgment, meaning that I weigh your good deeds against your bad. Okay. And if God were to do that, then we would always be in the in the negative. Okay. So it is Jesus Christ that comes and wipes that clean so that there's never this idea of we're balancing out because the the toll toll houses is where you 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 keep uh you keep going through these uh these gates that assess the good deeds you've done versus the bad deeds that you've done and this does not reconcile at all with the person of Jesus Christ because none of us are worthy in God's sight but through Jesus Christ now we have all been saved so none are worthy but we we can approach dare to approach through Jesus so it so toll toll houses for that main reason does not coincide with uh mainstream orthodoxy uh, next question from David Rigo. Does the Orthodox Church believe that what the Catholic Church does and that the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of Christ? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That it is. Um, there was some question about, you know, uh, is, is, there a, is there a difference in the, in the way that the priest says it? Okay. And there was, some, there was some talk about the fact that in the Catholic Church, the priest then then asks for this to be done and in the orthodox church we ask the holy spirit make this change but that is not true because i've looked in the missal of the catholic church and it does say the same words that we have which is and let your holy spirit now come down upon us and upon these gifts mm, i gavril p asks whether or not um our church follows the old or new calendar ours follows the new calendar so we are justinian oh okay yes yes uh we follow the new calendar except for easter where we yeah. follow the old calendar yeah. so we follow the gregorian calendar and then we follow the julian calendar for the dating of easter mm -hmm. you know uh, and i wish they would just get over themselves and just pick a date and let's move on you know <laughs> enough with the two dates for easter okay just pick a date and let's move forward it does have one benefit discount easter candy discount well, easter yeah. candy yeah that's yeah. that's that's the great benefit man they'll take that away from us no you can't no. <laughs> love warns ministries asks does orthodox warn ministry warn w-a-r-n-s oh okay like i was love thinking love is warning I, I was thinking of what's the uh uh um, saddleback who's that rick warren I, was thinking, I thought it was War, Rick Warren Ministries, Saddleback Church. Uh, does Orthodoxy believe we go to paradise or Abraham's bosom when we die or that we go straight to heaven? Explain, please. Well, again, we don't uh, we don't go and we don't re we get a foretaste. Now, the Orthodox Church and again, no, uh, there's there's no uh, there's no proof of this. But Orthodox tradition is that during that first nine days, we receive the foretaste of both. We receive the foretaste of what heaven is like and what hell is like. And then we await final judgment. So now, having said that, I know that we talk about our saints in heaven, okay? So there are, like the Virgin Mary, uh, that we believe has received her, has received her reward. We talk about the saints having received their reward. But all of us will are awaiting our final judgment when Jesus Christ comes. Uh, Diane, thank you so much for uh, donating with your super chat to live stream. Uh, she says, thank you all for continuing to do these Q&A Thursday nights. It's always a pleasure and educational. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. It's really fun to do this and interact with y'all. Um, right. Let's try to do a bit of a speed round um, so we can get through more of these questions. The first question, explain the Holy Trinity. Yes. Snap, snap. <laughs> um, do, 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 do. So pardon me, but I might skip questions or uh miss them and it's not intentional uh i'm trying to find one uh so uh do 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 question from tyree morris okay. are there any sites i can find orthodox scholar scholarly articles 
or articles by Orthodox scholars? Oh, there's geez, uh, there's a uh, there's a uh, there's a lot of sites. Um, the uh, I, I got to admit the the GOA is a is a great place to start. Uh, so go arch uh, go arch dot org. You know, uh, that's a great source to start. Um, the uh, uh, and usually the uh, the OCA websites uh, OCA dot org and the uh, Antiochian Church they also have uh, uh, wonderful resources there and for most any topic. So all you've got to do is in Google. My recommendation is in Google type out what your question is. Uh, toll houses, okay, and then when it comes up. Look for labels that say OCA.org or Antiochian.org or, or GOA.org. Or Google that question with that thing. With, and with like um, Toll Houses, OCA, yeah. search. Yes, yeah, yeah right, right. Yeah. Those are those are reliable sources. A lot of times, unfortunately, if you just do a straight Google search, you will end up in bizarre places. Okay. I but wonder, those three are very good starting points. I wonder if you could also use Google Scholar too to like look for things like it'll probably be more academic type but you could try um and see if you find anything interesting there i like uh there's a site called annunciation um, <laughs> well there, yeah. we we do have there, we there, do have there, some there, position papers there's, there. there's an article at least once a month there's there's uh, something there that's right that's right we got a we got an online catechism for you there yes yeah uh, but um, um, speed round. Okay, Nathan says, I don't believe St. Mary ascended into heaven. Can I still become Orthodox? Yes. The answer is, the answer is yes. Uh, because, again, our faith rests in Christ. Now, uh, n now the, uh, the Virgin Mary and her assumption is not dogmatic. It's doctrine. So it is not biblical. Right, but it is doctrine and doctrinal tradition of the Orthodox Church. But it not believing it is not unsalvific. Mm -hmm. uh, Migs twenty six eighty two. How many times has the Divine Liturgy changed? The Orthodox Church uses John Chrysostom and Saint Basil. Is there a version that existed before? Why did the Orthodox Church stick with the current version? Well, actually, uh, even even past, uh, you know, we started with the St. James Liturgy, um, and then St. Basil modified it, uh, changed it around. St. John Chrysostom improved it a little bit, if I can say, use the word improved. But the liturgy has actually changed even since St. John Chrysostom's time, and so there are things that uh, there are things that are different from a little bit different from what John Chrysostom did. But generally speaking, the, the the liturgy has not appreciably changed since St. John Chrysostom's uh, time. Uh, we have a question about Holy Week from Aaron. Why is the service of the taking down from the cross done primarily in the Greek Orthodox Church? And how did that tradition come about? Wait, what? The tradition of uh, taking, taking him down from yes. the cross? Now, why is that done primarily in the Greek Orthodox Church? That's true. I, I actually, I, I can't recall it happening in another denomination. Yeah. Um, so, so the uh, without turning it into a dramatic show, it is important that the Orthodox Church engage all of our senses and our reason. So we feel the Orthodox Church feels that. Through a visual presentation of Jesus's life through his Passion Week, that we can more clearly appreciate and internalize what happens. So by physically reading the gospel and then seeing that, seeing Jesus come off the cross, being wrapped in a linen shroud, just enforces through a physical, uh, through through not only hearing the gospel, but seeing it and reinforces that idea so that we understand the progression of events of Jesus' Passion Week. Now, when did that begin? Ooh, that's a good, uh, that's well, a good question. While you're looking up, what I assume oh, is uh, <laughs> an example. Um, we mentioned before that a lot of, of what happens in the church um, is visual. And yes. I assume that this practice, I might be completely wrong here, but I'm going to make the assumption that kind of like the stained glass windows and the icons that we see, 
that that action was meant um, to come up to to be communicated in a visual yeah, that's matter exactly right. in a time when people couldn't read or have access to the Bible or books. Yeah. yeah, but I don't I, I the only reason I disagree, I, I might disagree with that is because I think that that. Many of these things that we do with uh, not the epitaphio because we have writings of Saint John Chrysostom, but with the the actions of taking the cross around, taking him down off of the cross, I think these are more modern innovations mm. that we have put in to create a sense of drama that were not necessarily present. Now the answer. Uh oh. More some, books. Some speed round, Marissa. Yeah, okay, I'm, have, he's pulling out four books. No, it's okay. I'm, I'm just... <laughs> I so, love it. I love it. So, uh, one, Alcavides uh, Calivas, in his book, uh, The Liturgy and Dialogue, this is a great resource for looking at the history. I've already mentioned the book on Hugh Wybrew, which is The Evolution of Divine Liturgy, and then also one of the more famous... Uh, uh, Nicholas, uh, Father Nicholas Cabasilas, or N Nicholas Cabasilas, is famous commentary on the divine liturgy. You will find the uh, the answer to the evolution of the liturgy from the time of Hagia Sophia all the way to the present time in these three books. Hugh, uh, 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 Calibus, right? No, oh, no, and the other one is Hugh Wybrew. Uh, okay, next question is from David Neck. It is odd sometimes. I feel disconnected to my faith and spirituality. How can I feel more spiritual or connected despite going to church weekly? Sometimes I just feel like disconnected. Other days I feel this amazing spiritual connection. Well, I think, you know, and and again, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm I'm really hitting this blind, but uh, connection in the church requires engagement with the community. Because it is Jesus ha did tell us to pray in secret. That's private prayer. But equally so, throughout all of the epistles, there is always the discussion of corporate prayer, meaning that we come together as a community. So when I see people that come in and they say, Father, I'm not there for the people. I'm just there for the liturgy for myself. That's a selfish idea. The idea is you come to be with with your fellow Christians. So an ecclesia, right, is to be called out, not singly called out, but to be called out as a group, all right? Mm -hmm. So part of that lack of spirituality is if you are not connected to the community, then the liturgy is a very lonely thing for you, all right? So part of that has to be that not all, the liturgy gives me the spiritual strength that I need to get through the week that I can engage with my fellow man. Mm -hmm. Uh, L Global says or asks question about dreams. Mm -hmm. If I have a dream and I'm happy in the dream, I will have a stenohoria. I think I'm saying that mm -hmm. right. The next day, most times. So this makes me worry. The next day, what can I do, Father? Well, okay, you know, one, um, try not to try not to put undue stock in dreams. Okay, um, you know, dreams. Uh, can have all can really a lot of times have no meaning at all. It's just right the brain trying to work some stuff out. Yeah. Right? Okay. So not everything that you dream has some kind of meaning to it. All right. If there are disturbing dreams, okay, there's something that has to be unpacked there, and that has to be professionally unpacked. Right. Uh -uh asking me no no i'm no. saying you know i'm saying yeah. you know if if uh if you're having stenochoria because you're constantly having this dream and it's causing you anxiety okay then that's something that needs professional assistance did you, did you um translate the word yeah oh what does uh mean? anxiousness and worry yes. right um so so if that's the case and that's constant then there's something there that the brain is trying to work out and you just don't know what that is yet or haven't come to terms with it. And it needs to be professionally kind of flushed out, so to speak. But if we're just talking about that you have a crazy dream. Do, no, that's not good. Sorry, I just thought it was professionally flushed out. Like I'm thinking of like getting your ears irrigated or oh, something. Anyway, sorry. Is it, is it fleshed out or flushed out? I don't, flushed out. Yeah. Flushed out. Okay. So no flushing going no, on. No, 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 no flushing. It's flushing. Get that yes. stuff fleshed yeah. out. Okay. 
<laughs> so, <What>? but <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry this went weird. Keep going. All right. Okay, so uh, oh, man, now I lost. <laughs> Maybe it's a good thing because this is a speed round. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, but yeah, mine test. Don't place. Too, don't place too much uh, thing in uh, in stock and dreams. Mind test win says, Father, can you talk about the monastic vocation in Orthodox Church? Is there a distinguished term like diocese? Diocese. Diocese. Well, it's diocesan kind of like priest oh, and yeah, religious yeah, yes. priest. As oh, I heard, diocesan, diocesan yeah, priest, yeah, right. diocesan priest and religious priest, as I've heard in the Catholic Church in the Orthodox church so monasticism in the orthodox church is not the same as monasticism in the catholic church um, monasticism uh, in the orthodox faith did not have different orders there's only one order but there can be franciscan there can be um uh, uh, uh jerome i'm trying to think of the there's different jesuits. orders what jesuits. jesuits so there's different orders we do not have that in the in the uh, in the orthodox church now i will say that the monastic tradition is something that needs to be kept within our Orthodox faith because this is the people that pray for the whole world. They are the beacon on the hill that shows us the kind of life we should be leading. Without the, without the monastics, we are left now in this secular world and we can be easily then taken away. You know, and 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 we can we can be led astray. It is the monastics that preserve the, what is true orthodoxy. So we need to have that, mm. but we have to recognize that we are not monastics. Okay, we live in the world. They are the beacon. They are the light. They are the bar that we should attain. Okay, but we're not monastics, and that's where the problem comes many times. Is people want to be a monastic, and they are not. So mm -hmm. we have to understand that separation. Uh, so Nicholas uh, de Philippus says or asks, so the church will only marry people who are going to try to have children. So like, what's the take? I think someone else asked this as well um, down in the chat. I think it was, I will find you. Well, someone asked like what the Orthodox take is on people who are married and don't have children. Well, we're married and we don't have children. So you you and I mean, oh, well, okay. not not you. Congratulations! <laughs> well, That's there's really another funny. blooper for you. <laughs> yeah. Oh Lord, Lord have mercy. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, Bessie, Ted, and I yeah. are, uh, are are married. <laughs> yeah. All right, and we do we. <laughs> What's the word you do over Holy Week? That's right. Well, I I don't have any kids now. Um. So um. Oh, where was I now? Uh, so yeah, is it is it okay to have a marriage uh, in orthodoxy with no kids? Okay, so yeah. so uh, so orthodoxy very very clearly. When you are married in the Orthodox Church, you are king and queen of your new kingdom, and your marriage is complete. Period. Okay. Mm -hmm. Orthodoxy considers children to be a blessing that comes out of marriage, but not a necessity of marriage. Okay, you are a complete unit as husband and wife. OK, so like I said, if you come into the marriage and you say to the priest, we will not have kids, that is an impediment to marriage. OK, but, you know, if you have the desire, but it doesn't happen, then this is God. OK, you are not under no obligation now to go through in vitro fertilization and surrogate motherhood and uh, doing all those other things. You're no under uh, no obligation to do that. OK, we, we so we didn't have kids. All right. That's that's where we are. Our marriage is complete. Now, to say that you have to have kids, I've married many 60 and 70 year old people, not many, but some. OK, they're not having kids. All right. So if they tell me, you know what, I don't think we're having kids, that is not going to be an impediment to marriage. But if they come to me at 25 or 35 and say, we don't want to have any kids, then there'd be a question there. Hmm. So Anesti Hatsisavas asks, when we confess a sin and we are absolved of it through confession, can we confess the same sin or is it considered already forgiven? Thanks. Another book. <laughs> The man wants to be precise. I like it. Ah, so much book today. So, so much. Well, you know, I mean, it's hey, okay. You can you, know, you can book it up if you want. 
Do you remember that? I don't know if uh, you may you may have been older. I don't know if they still do it, but uh, when I was a kid, Pizza Hut had uh, the book it program. I nope. Where if you read enough books, it would give you a sticker, and then you get a free pizza. It was a very healthy. Actually, thing. Yeah, yeah, I do remember this. So you it say, was you say book it? I think of that. Oh wow, yeah. All right, so Crazy. Orthodox priest service book, right? Uh -huh. Okay. We need a new one. Oh well, it's a little far apart. Okay. <laughs> Uh, may I'm doing the whole prayer, okay? Okay. All right. Okay. May God forgive you of all things through me, a sinner, both in this world and the world to come, and set you uncondemned before his terrible judgment seat, and have no further care for the sins which you have confessed and depart in peace. If you confess the same sin, that is a sin. Now, this excludes you committing the same sin again. So you come to me and you say, hey, Father, I went yesterday and I shoplifted some stuff and I knew I shouldn't have done that. Okay, why did you shoplift? We talk about that, this and this and blah, blah, blah. I read the confession prayers. Have no further concern about the sin you have confessed. If you come back to me next week and you go, hey, Father, uh, yeah, yeah. Last week I I shoplifted again. This is not the same sin. You are you have sinned again, right? This is a new sin. So this is double sin. Well, we, yeah, it's a no, not a double, but it's another sin. Uh -huh. You have sinned again. Okay, in that sense, yes, you have to confess that sin because you've got a problem. Because now, if you come to me again and you say, "All right, hey, I've shoplifted again," okay, now we got to turn this over to a professional. But if you come back to me that next week and you say, "Father, I still feel guilty about," That shoplifting I did two weeks ago, that's a sin. Ah. Because I said, the, I, I said, the prayer said, have no further concern about the sin. And people do that. They will come back to me and they will say, I, I still can't forgive myself for, well, who are you to say that God has forgiven your sins and now you are better than God? That is a sin. Well put. Uh, next question is yeah, from... I know there's so many books. Well, there could be more. I shouldn't speak so soon. Tyler Mancuso um, says, uh, since Martin Luther was protesting the Catholic Church, why did he not convert to Orthodoxy? Did he not know? Did Protestants of that time not know much about Eastern Orthodoxy? Oh, no, no, absolutely. We have quotes from Martin Luther where he talks about, he specifically talks about the fact that the Orthodox Church, unlike the Catholic Church, although although discrepant in some things, is an acceptable church. So Martin Luther knew who we were, but the commune, and, and actually Martin Luther threw Philip, oh man, I'm trying to remember, he had a big long name, started with M. Martin Luther didn't visit the East personally himself, but through this Philip, oh golly, um, Philip M., who was an ambassador to between uh, b b uh, between the we the West and the East? Martin Luther communicated to him uh, through him. So yes, Martin Luther knew who the Orthodox were, but he was still in disagreement with some of the doctrines that the Orthodox Church held. And so one was specifically our t our teachings of tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Carla, for uh, for mentioning the how much uh, your kids like the virtual Sunday school videos. Awesome. Yeah, Demos awesome. puts a lot of hard work into. He does. That. He does. Well, it's very rare that I hear you know I, feedback I, on them. Well, from kids specifically, Aww. I, I, I want to hear more about what kids uh, think of the videos. Yeah. Uh, so if you have kids that watch them, please uh, let me know. Mm. And the ages too. I'm very curious to see what ages okay. are watching. Yeah, well, what you know, what works for some ages, what doesn't work for other ages. Okay. You know, okay. what will make yeah. them better. Did you find uh, Philip? Uh... No, I don't know. I see, well, that'll Malinch be that'll be the homework Malinch for next week. Uh, Malak Ma 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 Malankthon from Joe Jones. Oh, okay. Philip Malankthon. Yeah. See, I can't. I... Yes, I it's can't a pronounce bit, it. Yeah, it's a, I, and I, and I am afraid to pronounce it. I know it's close to but, a bad Greek word. But yeah, uh, um, yeah, it's not Philip Malaka. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh. Oh boy. Uh, How about the suggestions for the Jesus book? Yeah. Um, Strange Places asked, and I'm sorry about this. I got distracted earlier because I saw you ask this before, but. They asked, uh, any advice on the Jesus prayer and what version to use? Um, 
yes, there are several there are several versions. Again, uh, the important part is Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Some say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. But the idea is the recognition of Jesus Christ as the one who forgives sins and grants mercy and then have mercy on me. So there's really don't worry about don't worry about the mechanics of, you know, did I say it exactly right? Are you asking are, are you using Lord Jesus Christ? Are you asking for his mercy and are you directing that mercy on you? Then you're good. Leave it at that. Um if you can do me a favor, Demos, and look for Aaron's question. That... Oh, yeah, we asked, oh, we asked it? Question. Okay. Yeah, that was the one I jumped back up to. Uh, but Vasco oh. Venti... I was getting oh, to oh, that. Hold up. Oh, what, good. what did you have? Oh. Uh, Vasco Venti asked um, whether or not the church can summon an ecumenical council post-schism, and if not, is that a problem? The Catholic Church feels that they can... They can uh, absolutely, because they feel they're a universal church, that they can call an ecumenical council, and they have. The Orthodox Church disagrees with that wholeheartedly because unless all five patriarchs are present, you cannot have an ecumenical council in the Orthodox Church. Mm. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, Carla asks, is it bad for me to debate some theology of the Roman Catholic Church with my mother-in-law? Last time we did, um, <laughs> she said Orthodox are not Christian and kept calling me a rebel. Well, that's not very nice. And she goes on to say... Uh, I feel I shouldn't stay quiet, but it just feels bad to hear so much attack. Yeah. So, again, uh, going back to an earlier question that we had, again, don't don't make it, don't create too much family tension. What you have to find out is what is it that makes her think that the Orthodox Church is not Christian? So be Socratic. Say, okay, all right. Let me hear why you think the Orthodox Church is uh, is not Christian. And let her answer, and then you provide answers to that question. But don't engage in a debate that says, no, you're wrong, we're right. Because that's going to get nowhere, and it's going to cause family turmoil and drama, and you don't need any of that. So be more on the, def be more on the offensive. Why do you think that the Orthodox Church is not Christian? Let me, let me help you. Maybe I can help clear up some things that you may not understand about us. Uh, so we're going to do two more questions. Two or three more questions, yes. Okay, so uh, Andrew92HT asks, what is the Orthodox view on UFOs? Could it be a part of the Great Deception? You know, we do have, uh, if you do a quick search on our channel, we have two videos that explore uh, the Orthodox perspective on not only aliens and UFOs, but further on abductions and so forth. We, a we answer the questions of whether they're, you know, uh, what the Christian view is, if they're demons, are they really supernatural, could aliens exist? So we go into more detail in those two videos are part of our, I believe, the 101 series but uh father would you like to elaborate a little bit further yeah just very very quick again going back to genesis if we read genesis correctly what it says here is in the beginning god made heaven and earth okay if you look at if you look at the hebrew just we have the same difficulty that we have in uh, John's prologue, where we have the missing article, which is then translated incorrectly. So, in the beginning, um, the in the beginning was the word, and the word was a God. And we certainly would not translate it that way. We translate it as, and the word was God. Here, if you read it properly in the Hebrew, it's not in the beginning. It is in beginning. God made heaven and earth. So what that tells us is that this was a beginning. In beginning, he did this. Now, that does not rule out that there are other beginnings. This is not the totality of who God is. It is the totality of who he is. Not totality. It is written for us here as the created beings in this world. Okay? That does not in any way negate the fact that God could have created other life forms in other areas and has chosen not to reveal that to us. So it does nothing 
adverse to our faith if all of a sudden now green men land on this planet. Okay, nothing happens to that because God is God, and then he can choose then to create other life. And we already have proof of that. God has created other life that's non you know, comported to Earth. Look at the angels. Look at... Oh, yes, yeah. very good point. Yeah. The angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, right. And the angels, as described in the Bible, if, uh, if uh, somebody were to see one today, they would probably think it's something out of this world naturally right right you know and and then the descriptions of uh through uh that we have from isaiah yeah you know exactly about the chariot that. and elijah and, and right. the eyes you know, right man. oh yeah <laughs> exactly uh david neck is wondering whether or not like they must be baptized in a community setting or in public um and they're wondering if they could get baptized in private or in a familiar based gathering well they have to be baptized in the church but it, it most most ninety nine percent of the baptisms that we do are private, meaning that the family is in attendance and it's done on a Saturday or some other day of the week and not on Sunday. Mm -hmm. It can be done on Sunday in a public uh, in a public setting, but it does not have to be. No. So Diane, thank you very much again. Um, she wants to state that Hebrew does not translate word for word into English, not at all. Oh well, very good. Thank you, Diane. Uh, but yeah, let's do one more question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, boy, oh boy, yeah. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go with out a, on a banger with a real quick uh, thank you to David Braun who further yes. elaborated that it's uh, Philip um, Melanchthon. Yeah, I'm once again mispronouncing it, but it. Uh, Actually, Greek. He was originally Philip Schwarzerd, uh Meaning black earth. Meaning black earth. Yeah. Schwartz. Ah, okay. Yeah. But, um, okay. So, I'm going to go out on... on... On a bang, right? On a bang. And that question is, and I'm forgetting who said it, but the question is, is the Mount Athos trip still happening? Yes, but it's going to happen in 23. Ah. That, I thought it was going to... And I'm gonna I'm gonna end on a bombshell because as somebody who live streams all of this, it's a very good question to ask. Why do priests insist on uh, this is from MG B Sec Teacher? Uh, why do priests insist on having such long orthros liturgies and other <laughs> services? Is longer always better? Why insist on Greek Byzantine chant when our youth have no connection to it? Uh oh. It's all on you. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, the 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 service is what the service is. There's not really much I can do. The only thing that I can do is talk a little bit faster, right? That's all that I can do. If you will notice in our service, we do not have chanting prima donnas, right? You know, we they don't get up there and they last for two hours. They're very, very, you know, I don't want to even say quick, but they are they 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 flow the liturgy very, very nicely. Our choir does the same thing. They don't go on and on, but they sing the liturgy very, very nicely. So the so the liturgy is and the orthros is confined by what the hymns are. There's really nothing that we can do about that. But what we can do is not let prima donnas come in and then try to overly elongate the service. And to be honest, as far as priests go, you're one of the fastest talking that I have seen. Oh, so well, that's already a right. blessing. Good. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Father Jerry and I are about the same speed, so... Yeah, because he can he can uh, he can whip through a liturgy too. Yeah. But uh, this idea of Father, can you cut out one of the holy might, holy God, holy mighties? You know, can you not say so many petitions? How about if we cut out a few hymns? What hymns do you want me to cut out? I mean, at, you know, so. Oh, well, while we're at it, can we just skip everything and just go straight to communion? I mean, what 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 did they? What, I mean, it, this is part of the experience of going to church, orthros, and I'm. And mind you, I'm not I'm not looking at this in a literal perspective. But I'm kind of thinking of it from a filmmaking perspective. It's almost like an overture. It gets you in the mood. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. 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 And it is Sunday school. I mean, it is Sunday school for adults. It's what yeah. it's supposed to be. Yeah. It's part of the experience. You know, everything nowadays has to be fast. Take a moment and sit down and enjoy the surroundings. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. 
So uh, right. I know we didn't get to every single yeah. I'm sorry, question everyone. Tonight. But um, uh, oh man, we've already been. Yeah. We started this show at an hour, and we yeah. and now was an hour and a half. Almost two hours. And now it's almost two hours, <laughs> it's, and it it wears on my hosts. It's it's probably going to get to the point where we're going to make this two hours. Oh good lord! Aww. I'm never going to get anybody that's going to uh, that's going to host with me. <laughs> oh yes, oh, yeah. yes. So I wanted to say to all the Irinis that are out there. Uh, I wanted to say a happy name day and also, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Kronipola. And I think that that name day is most appropriate because Irini means uh, peace. So, and that's what we're looking for the situation in Ukraine, right? Yeah. We're looking for peace. So today is a beautiful day for us to pray for peace in the Ukraine and, and to say Kronipola to all those that are Irinis. Oh, there's more than. Yeah. There's also there's always many names uh, each name day. It's also what is today's date? Um, well, it'll be to, it will be uh, yesterday that we're looking for, right? Yes, yeah, because so we've already we're crossed over for the fourth. Uh, so uh, it's Star Wars Day. That's, that's I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> Ephraim Irenaeus. Irene. Oh, and so for Ephraim. And for Irenaeus and for Irene, all of you, Kornipola and Christos Anesti. All right, and for every uh, for everyone else, uh, once again, if we didn't get to your question, please hang on to it and resubmit it uh, next week. Uh, I'm also putting aside a few of the ones we uh, we haven't gotten to. Maybe release a few exclusives. Um, we'll see. We'll see if we can add that to the schedule. Uh, we're very thankful to be back. And uh, looking yes. forward to more two-hour shows. <laughs> at one point, at one point, I can see this. It's gonna happen next year. We're gonna be sitting here. I'm like, I remember when this used to be an hour. Now we're doing this for five and a half hours. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, <sighs> trust me. At uh, anything more than two hours, you're gonna start losing me. All right. Forget about the host. You're gonna start losing me. Well, we're you know I've already got that worked out. I have the Red Bull IV drip. It's ready. Okay. All right. And that doesn't sound good. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll be join us this Sunday and we'll see you next week. And again, Marissa, it's great to have you uh, happy here again, huh? Yeah. And again, thank you, thank President you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.